welcome back. What started out as an exhibit highlighting the Latin experience with immigration and a pandemic has now become a short documentary. 23 Our Labor Save Lives focuses on the 23-day hunger strike that led to $2.1 billion in relief for excluded workers. Let's take a quick look at the trailer. Tanto como yo, vendedora, como los que trabajan en casa, como los que trabajan de, de lavandería, pintando uñas, los que trabajan de, deli de delivery. Aún así estamos aquí nosotros, pero nuestros compañeros, nuestro pueblo inmigrante está trabajando afuera. Y no se unen a uno a veces por miedo, pero aquí estamos los que tenemos, no tenemos miedo y estamos por ello. Estamos aquí todos mis compañeros sin comer, mientras que usted... Basta con su familia, comiendo rico, ustedes comiendo rico, mientras que nosotros comemos, ¿qué? Dolor, dolor de estómago, dolor de cabeza, dolor de huesos, no es justo. Así que queremos justicia para todos. Director, producer, and editor of the film, Jali Brown Cepeda, joins me to discuss this project. Jali, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, we spoke a few times, and I understand the last time we spoke, you were telling us about the exhibit with MoMA PS1 titled Nueva Yorkinos, Essential and Excluded. For those who don't know, can you talk a little bit about that journey and how it led to this? Yeah, so Nueva Yorkinos, Essential and Excluded, um, that, was, that happened last fall to um, this early winter. And it was a multimedia project that censored the 23-day hunger strike um, that undocumented workers and allies alike in New York City, Westchester, throughout the state um, underwent to make sure that undocumented folk uh, received adequate COVID relief um, in terms of, you know, monetary assistance. And so for, for the show itself, there was... Um, photos that were taken for the exhibit, photos that, that were taken before um, the exhibit. Um, there, there were different parts of um, protest art. So from, from di like that, from uh, the pots and pans to uh, the different signs, we created a living room space in, in the middle for folks to, you know, sit and contemplate. And part of this exhibit was also 23. It was uh, the film, but um, I was able to kind of like finesse it a bit more after uh, the exhibit was done. Now, I really want to talk about that. That sounds just so amazing. Um, and it's so great to see like, you know, your work continuing to expand and go on to other things. Can you just talk about the ways the project, you know, expanded from the exhibit into, you know, a short film, kind of like a standalone short film? Yeah, so um, I wanted to do something where I was able to like further use the tools that, that I have um, to help, you know, um, memorialize this story. And I was very, um, I was very humbled and very honored that that the people who uh, underwent this uh, hunger strike and uh, some of the people who organized this hunger strike, one of the co-organizers I became very close with and she trusted me to, you know, tell this story. And so the film actually played... Um, a bit at the end of uh, our show in January, but it didn't have its premiere until, or its New York City premiere um, formally until a couple weeks ago. Um, but it has played uh, throughout the country in a few different film festivals, which was really uh, dope for lack of a better word. And I wasn't expecting it, but um, I, you know, I just felt that that there should be something aside from um, you know, photos aside from this beautiful protest art and aside from this incredible show that I had the opportunity to do, but something that, you know, folks can always go back to and something that the hunger strikers themselves or the organizers themselves can play, you know, for the hunger strikers, can play for their kids. So, you know, I wanted to um, create something that was a little bit uh, longer lasting. I love that you mentioned that because I always think of any sort of media as like something that is just lasting forever, right? So 10 years from now, people can watch this and kind of understand what people were going through during that time. So I love that you brought that up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the title, uh, 23, Our Labor Save Lives. Can you tell us, you know, why you decided to go with that? I want to add that 
already I'm learning a lot. So, so I think it's an amazing title. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so 23 is 23 in Spanish and the hunger strike uh, was a 23 day hunger strike. And the film is roughly 23 minutes. Um, and their labor saved lives. Undocumented labor saves lives all the time throughout the pandemic. That's the first time that you're hearing of the words, you know, um, essential workers, but undocumented workers, immigrant uh, workers, black, brown labor, like this has already been essential um, since 1492, you know, so, um, and since the onslaught of, you know, transatlantic slave trade and colonization, like our labor has always saved lives. And so, um, I wanted to, and in this particular moment, you know, um, people who already don't have, or people who already didn't have much, um, were further putting themselves into a position where they weren't eating, where they weren't drinking, or they were drinking water, but, you know, they weren't eating any, uh, anything substantial, and their bodies were, um, you know, literally decaying, and so our labor saved lives, meaning that, you know, from, from their labor of this 23-day hunger strike, um, they ended up being able to pass this monumental $2.1 billion fund that in turn saved lives, you know? So by them putting their lives on the line for 23 dias, for 23 days, they were able to, um, you know, do something really remarkable for all of immigrant and undocumented New York. Now in the film, we actually get to hear from the people, you know, that were a part of the 23 day hunger strike. You know, what was that experience like for you and why was it crucial for you to continue empowering people to talk about their experiences? Because I remember the last time we spoke, that was something that was always important to you. So can you talk about why you wanted to continue that for this project? Absolutely. Um, so it's obviously um, we were only able to interview a handful of people, but there I want to mention that there were thousands of folks who, you know, um, participated in this movement and continue to participate in this movement. So although there are a handful of people talking in the film and they were interviewed for the film, those are not the only people who um, participated and are keeping this movement alive. But I wanted to, you know, pass the mic because A, who better knows this story than the people who participated in this, the people who didn't eat for 23 days, the people who, you know, experienced further destabilization because of the pandemic. And so it was important for me because I'd rather, you know, um, provide the space in terms of the privilege that, that I have, I want to use that privilege to open up the doors and, and to provide the spaces for, you know, um, dialogue, for, for conversation, for um, catharsis, for learning, for unlearning, for, um, for memory. And again, you know, it, it's important, like the, this was a huge moment and it is still such a huge moment, not just for New York City history, but for the history of the country. And so I wanted to, you know, talk to people and ask them what it felt like being part of something so historic because the hunger strike bill, the $2.1 billion um, bill that New York State um, passed in 2021, um, this bill, there, there's been nothing like it in terms of economic assistance for undocumented people throughout the United States, throughout the 50 states, right? So um, that's that's huge. And I wanted to, you know, give people a moment to um, reflect on that. And the questions were very, um, they were open-ended, they, they were general, so people felt comfortable actually going in into what they were, you know, um, dealing with and things like this. I feel that often when it comes to black and brown stories that are not told by, by the people, you know, it's always about, it's always about the, the struggle. It's always about the, um, the heaviness. It's always the tearjerker. But you know, and like people, a lot of documentarians, like there's already such a history of um, of exploitation within documentary, right? And so for that, I wanted to say, you know what, I'm going to ask you the most baseline questions. And from there, let's get into, you know, however far you want to get into remembering this um, particular moment. And it was beautiful. The interviews were conducted in Spanish. You know, again, whether you're Latino, Caribbean, um, a Spanish speaker, if you speak Creole, if, if you speak um, Mandarin, like there, there's already such a stigma when it comes to immigrants and, and their proficiency with English, right? And so why further stigmatize the people um, if they could just speak the language that like I also speak? So, you know, it was like those little things like here and there that, um, that were important to me and I'm really happy. Um, and I'm, I'm the happiest that the people who 
the the huelguistas, the um the the strikers and the organizers, I'm most happy because they love the film. That's so, amazing. That's, that's the biggest thing. <laughs> now, I really want to talk about, you talked about reflection, and you also mentioned your privilege. I want to talk about, you know, I think any movie that's good makes the person watching or a part of it reflect on their life or, like, who they are. And you said that it made you reflect on your life as a second-generation Dominican-American. Can you just talk a little bit more about that and what was going through your mind? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of times we get so wrapped up, you know, as people who are born in, in the United States, we get very wrapped up in um, in oppression, in, you know, I don't have this privilege and I want to fight for extra, you know, privileges that I, or human rights that I deserve. And, and unfortunately, I feel that oftentimes conversations about race and conversations about privilege and conversations about equity um, really do exclude immigrants because we are ready. And, and it was something that I had to, you know, grapple with when, when I was doing this film and when I ended up having to edit it because I wasn't planning on doing that, but I ended up having to do that. So I'm sitting with the material for like hours and hours and hours and hours. But, you know, you know, like it's important to realize that there is so much privilege and this may be a controversial statement, but it shouldn't be because it's true. There's so much privilege that comes with an American passport. There's so much privilege that comes with a birth certificate. There's so much privilege that comes with a social security card, with an ID, with not having to worry about going outside because you're, you know, um, you have to be weary of uh, police or of Homeland Security. Um, the freedom to take a train, the freedom to take a plane, the freedom to travel. A lot of, you know, there, there are so many things that um, when I when I would think about myself in terms of the privileges that I have in this country and in this world, I'd always rush to say I have no privileges as, you know, a black, indigenous, Latina, you know, um, Caribbean woman, second gen, whatever. I was very, you know, fast and quick to say, right. oh, I'm at the bottom of uh, the barrel. And again, in some ways I am. But in terms of my community, I'm not. I have immense privilege. And I feel it's very important for us, especially as folks who are part of the immigrant community, whether your grandparents, you know, immigrated here, whether it was your great grandparents. I feel like it's important to understand that and to locate yourself, because if you are so in like the self-deprecating hole of I have no privilege, then, you know, you're you're kind of like turning the blind eye. Again, this is what I, I, I started to feel about myself and the way that I was moving in this world. Um, I was ostracizing a community and kind of, you know, not necessarily thinking about my people in, right. and my relation to, to my people. And so, and when I say my people, I mean like all, all immigrant New York, you know, um, it's, it's the people. And so I just, you know, I, again, I feel like it's really important, especially if your work, um, well, no, it's important in general, but obviously if your work is centering a group of people that you are related to, but not directly a part of, but also if you're just, you know, a human in this world, walking in this world, living in this world, it's important to realize the privileges. It's important to realize the inequities, but, you know, using those privileges that, that you have to, you know, further uplift and amplify and, and just help out um, your fellow community, so... Well, we're at the end of our segment. I want to thank you so much. Can you quickly just let everybody know how they can view 23? So I don't know yet. Okay. I am planning. So because it's done with the film festival circuit, um, I am planning on on making the link public um, on Vimeo. But yes, let's yes, it's going to be available on Vimeo in a public link, but it could also be found or it will also be able to um, be found on my website as well. All right, Jali, thank you so much for bringing this, in, this information. Thank you. We'll be right back with more Open BXR Excuse